Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Token City Show. Today's guest has a, has a wealth of experience in the financial, financial sector, as well as the blockchain industry, and also the institutional world. She has roles as advisor and or member in numerous companies, including Salesforce, Salesforce Filecoin, and many, many more. She is also an advisory, advisory council member of the World Food Program, and she visits us today as the CEO of the Global Blockchain Business Council. Hi, Sandra. Welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um, let's go on to the first question. So you've had a very storied career in finance, tech, and cooperation for development. What have been some of the most memorable professional experiences you've had, and how would you say this diversity of occupations has impacted you and your work? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you so much uh, for having me on the question. Uh, I'm going to start with, you know, so very early on in my career, uh, I actually didn't know what I was really wanting to do. Um, maybe a lawyer, maybe definitely not a doctor, but maybe a lawyer, maybe a banker. I ended up on the trading floors of uh, Morgan Stanley and Deutsche Bank. And I started learning about the foreign exchange markets. And for a while, I thought, well, I'll just be a banker for most of my days. But what was very interesting very early on in my career was learning that technology was going to have a significant part of whatever I do. Uh, I was in the foreign exchange markets and we were incorporating tech all the time. Everything was going electronic. And ultimately, uh, further down in my career, I learned about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. And when I got to a place mid-level in my career where I could learn how to incorporate tech and financial services, um, it became even more apparent to me that that was important. But when I think about what was some of the most unique moments, um, and I'll tell a story here, they were really around the times when I didn't know what I was getting into. Meaning, uh, I was living in London at the time, and I was a banker, and I heard about Bitcoin, and I heard about the white paper. I pretty much ignored it for the first few years, and then I read it. And it was during the financial crisis of 08, 09. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, if this technology actually works and you can go peer to peer on most marketplaces and you can trade things around on the internet directly, that has significant impact. And that was the beginning of my journey. And I remember a few other foreign exchange traders in London, we used to do meetups, not formalized, not in nice places like we do today, but actually in some of the dingiest, darkest pubs in, in East London, we would meet to talk about uh, cryptocurrencies. And we didn't know very much back in like 2011, 12, 13, but that is how a lot of people grew up back then on learning about cryptocurrency markets. And then ultimately we are here today and I add the other part that you've added, which is the social impact, social um, aspects of how tech and financial services come together. And to me, that is what been some of the most important and enlightening parts of this journey, which is, okay, we have a bunch of tools. I was in the financial services for a long time, but what do we do with that? How can we actually work together on this collaborative technology to really build systems that are global and help each other and help those who are left out. And I think that's actually one of the biggest drivers for me right now on what I do, which is how do we use these tools to enable those who are most vulnerable, most excluded, and how do we make sure that people get access? Understood, awesome. Um, going on to our second question, um, you are now uh, the CEO of the Global Blockchain Business Council, which hosts more, of the, uh, more than 500 institutional members and 231 ambassadors across 109 jurisdictions. So this is the largest uh, advocacy DLT uh, organization in the world, right? So um, um, how, what can you tell us about the organization's mission and, and how does the organization approach it? So GBBC 
is a nonprofit uh, blockchain mm -hmm. and digital assets association based out of Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, we are made up of very large organizations, uh, very small organizations, and we are supported by members like Token City. And we really look to focus on three areas, education, on what this means for impact on society and industries. Number two, partnerships. How do we work together? As I mentioned before, this is a collaborative technology and you really cannot do this by yourself. And then number three, advocacy focusing on the world is going digital. Almost everything is going digital. And in that world, how are things going to be shaped? What are regulations going to look like? What are societal norms going to look like? How are we going to interact in this new next generation virtual world and economy? Hmm. Understood. Thank you so much for that. Um, going on with a little bit with more of the history, so to speak, or the present of uh, Global Blockchain Business Council, it recently merged with Global Digital Finance, which is another very uh, important institution in the advocacy space. Um, how do you assess the impact of that merger? Um, what does it represent for the industry? Yes, as, as you mentioned, GBBC merged with Global Digital Finance, which is now called GBBC Digital Finance, GDF, which is the Financial Services Division of GBBC. That merger happened a year ago, and I have known the GDF before. I was a board director there for many years, and so I was very familiar with the organization. And why did we merge? Well, we merged because number one, we realized that as this entire industry and community is growing globally, we need also a nonprofit organization to grow alongside that. And it needs also to be able to scale. And that was sort of the obvious reason to do so, is to get bigger so that we could have a larger footprint together. I think number two, one of the biggest reasons for why we merged is the teams knew each other. And when I think about the management team of GBBC and the management team of GDF, there was a lot of very positive relationships. And we knew that we were going to make anything work, even any challenges that came our way. And trust me, in the last year, we have seen our fair share of challenges, but we've also seen great gains of things that we couldn't do alone, um, that we couldn't do individually as organizations that we can now do together. All right. Um, now I wanted to ask you about uh, regulation, the regulatory landscape. As, as you are aware, um, here in the European Union, there's uh, the markets in crypto assets regulation, there's the pilot regime, which for us is particularly interesting. Um, for us uh, and for many other uh, companies, it provides much needed clarity, right? Um, uh, at the same time, the pilot regime, well, it's, it's, a, it's a sandbox environment. It, it it's, uh, sets restrictions. Uh, still, how, how do you see that? Uh, how do you assess the pilot regime? Um, do you think uh, it could, it could uh, be seen as an example for other jurisdictions? Absolutely. So number one, I was just in Europe last week. Mm -hmm. uh, we were in Brussels, uh, where there's a lot of activity right now. But we were also in Florence, Italy, as, and as well as the UK uh, at one point, and Dublin, Ireland as well. Uh, the shift is clear. With Mika passing and now being officially published in the journal, uh, I just think that we are in a different plane in Europe. Uh, you have a now a regime that allows for a framework that allows for uh, organizations, startups, big and small, to, to actually have an ability to, as someone put it, hang your hat on something. It is something to, as a first start, to be able to have some ground rules. I think there's a lot more to go. And you mentioned the DLT pilot regime. I think sandboxes uh, in their unique purposes are absolutely valuable. 
I don't know that it works in every country the same way. I think if you look at the FCA sandbox versus the lab CFTC sandbox and other sandboxes around the world, they're actually designed quite differently. So I think it's early days to see how the DLT pilot regime in, in the EU will evolve, but I do hope that lots of startups will inquire and at least a fair number will look to participate. Uh, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic on Europe and I think Europe, Europe leading on the regulatory side has really helped to drive some of the, uh, I call positive energy coming to the region. Of course, uh, if, if I may ask, um, uh, what would you say stands out from, from, from regulatory sandboxes when you mention other, other options? Um, I mean, what, what do you think, what, what's something that you would add or subtract, so to speak, um, yeah. in the case of the pilot regime, yeah? Yes, I have an instant answer for that because some of the early sandboxes around the world, uh, they didn't fail. They just, uh, I think, were finite uh, instances of, of experimentation on the regulatory side. Mm -hmm. I think one thing that we need to do in any sandbox scenario mm -hmm. is to figure out, okay, there is a process for a startup to come in, register, and then grow their product. But as they're growing their product, if you have a finite deadline for how long you can stay in the sandbox, it becomes a problem. Because what if I build a product and I don't have my license yet? Or there's not clear framework for me to have a license to grow into. I still need that in-between period of transition. And I think it's very important that any regulatory body that creates a sandbox allows for that transition period from creating something to then experimenting with a live audience or clients and then into fully licensed growth mode. And I, and I think that shepherding through and making sure there's infrastructure for the entire process is incredibly important for startups to be successful. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe the fact that it's, uh, let's say by tranches, uh, you know, three-year tranches, that, that's, that's probably along those lines. Um, going on with, with the next question, um, as you are very well aware, the financial sector is pushing very, very hard towards uh, blockchain adoption, right? Um, from, from, from that point of view, it seems, at least uh, in my opinion, a little... Um, I would say almost uh, deterministic that, it's, that, it, that, that mass scale blockchain adoption is going to be driven by, by the financial sector, right? Um, however, if you talk to people who come from the DeFi world, their perspective is, no, no, it's going to come from, from other types of sectors, not necessarily DeFi, but, you know, uh, e-commerce and whatnot. What's your stance on that? How do you see that? So. Whichever industry comes first, I think, is really TBD. Uh, I can assure the audience that every industry sector that we know of is working towards, uh, some are in pilot stage, some are in actual production stage, but all of these different industries are evolving and they're solving for different problems. To answer your question about whether it's financial services versus another category like e-commerce, I actually think the convergence will come around the same time, meaning, what do I mean by that? What do I mean by that is that you're going to have lots of different industries working on different problem sets, and at some point they will converge to actually hopefully create what we need, our baseline utilities, meaning we have maybe not one blockchain or two blockchains, but we have a number of underlying systems that interoperate and can talk to each other. Because if we don't build that over time, then what's the point of having these um, new systems? Because they're all gonna be siloed again. So I think one of the biggest challenges that we need to see is, okay, fine, even if financial services does evolve and create some of the early uh, products for next generation digital economy, it still needs to be compatible and work with next generation e-commerce, next generation, uh, pretty much anything, identity, and also um, supply chain and other categories. So I think the convergence of all of these coming together, 
that's in the future. I don't can tell you exactly when, but it's incredibly important. And by the way, that will also inv involve big data, AI, and all of the other buzzwords that people talk about. Good. Uh, it looks like a completely different world. When that, once you mention all those uh, pieces of the puzzle coming together, absolutely. Um, okay. I don't know if uh, these are the questions that I had prepared for you. Uh, I don't know if there's anything else you would like to add, something to tell our audience. Well, if I'm going to leave you with the final note, I will uh, mention something that I've been talking a lot about, and I mentioned this with some of the um, European um, counterparts last, last week. Generation Z will be one-third of the world population by 2025. One-third. Uh, right now, they're between the ages of about 13 to 25 years old. As they go into the workforce over the next 10 years, we're going to see a change in the way we not only work and, and live, but as the digital world is shaped. And I think this Gen Z generation is going to be key to how a lot of this evolves. So frankly, I think we should all listen and, and adapt and be flexible. Awesome. Thank you so much for those last words, for your presence in the show. Uh, we are very happy to have you here, come, come today, come, for you to have come here today. Uh, and we hope to see you sometime uh, soon. Thank you so much, Sandra. Thank you. Take care. Bye. You too. Bye-bye. Well, that was all for today. Thank you so much. Uh, and we hope to see you all soon as well. Bye-bye.